Hello and welcome to History and Film. I'm Rich Simmons. We were last in North America over 500 years ago with Kings of the Sun, where a community of Mayans encountered a tribe of what was presumably part of the Mississippi River Valley civilization. We did see Spanish conquistadors in South America tormenting locals and each other in the Amazon rainforest in the 16th century, but today will be the first time we deal with what could really be considered the history of the United States of America as we get into the French and Indian War. First off, no one outside of the United States really refers to it as the French and Indian War. That's primarily because it was only part of the more global Seven Years' War that some historians have even labeled World War Zero, as there was fighting on five continents. Though it's also understandable for Americans to treat it as a separate conflict as hostilities began a couple years before the Seven Years' War. The Age of Exploration led to European powers establishing colonies all over the world and carving up the Americas. Inevitably, they butted heads, and centuries-long tensions between England and France continued in the New World. The battle lines of the French and Indian War don't follow any borders we'd recognize today. Roughly speaking, you could cut the states of Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine in half, with the British controlling the southern and eastern half of the line, and the French controlling the northern and western half. The fighting also stretched up into what is now New Brunswick and Nova Scotia in Canada. The French side was outnumbered and relied heavily on their alliances with Native American tribes. Hence, the name of the war is the opponents of the British army and English colonists, though some Native American tribes did side with the Brits. Territorial tensions in western Pennsylvania became violent in 1754 at the Battle of Jumonville Glen. It was a small skirmish in which a 22-year-old George Washington led a colonial force to ambush some French Canadians who had been bullying a British construction site. A larger Canadian force later forced Washington to surrender. England and France were not yet at war, and this incident is considered both the start of the French and Indian War and one of the contributing factors to the later start of the Seven Years' War. The Last of the Mohicans opens in 1757 with the opening text, The American Colonies. It is the third year of the war between England and France for possession of the continent. Three men, the last of a vanishing people, are on the frontier west of the Hudson River. So this is considerably east of that first battle with Washington. The Hudson River begins in upstate New York and flows down into New York City. The three men mentioned are fictional characters invented by James Fenimore Cooper in his series of novels called The Leather Stocking Tales. The Last of the Mohicans is the second in the five novel series. The main character, played by Daniel Day-Lewis, is Nathaniel Poe, also known as Hawkeye or Natty Bumpo in the Fenimore Cooper books. The other two are his adoptive Native American father and brother of the Mohican tribe, not to be confused with the Mohawk or Mohegan tribes, which are also in this area. Though Cooper himself seems to have had trouble with that, and I guess in the books he associates facts about the Mohegans with his Mohicans. And despite the epic and sad-sounding title, there's no historical basis for any of these nations dying completely out at this time. So while he could say that his characters were the last of their particular tribe, there are still Mohican people alive today. So, back to the movie. Our trio live with and among people on the frontier, and we see them having dinner with the Cameron family, whom they seem to know very well. The next day, British officers are in the village recruiting men to fight against the French. Some agree to, though they grumble that it's not their fight. Some recognize that their loyalty does still lie with the British crown, But it's also easy to see that the colonists are starting to see themselves as a different people from England. And we know, of course, that will bubble over into revolution within two decades. Anyway, a small contingent of British soldiers led by a man named Hayward are charged with escorting the two young adult daughters of a Colonel Monroe to their father at Fort William Henry. Both Hayward and these two women are fictitious, though the name Monroe is borrowed from the actual British lieutenant colonel in charge of Fort William Henry at the time. Their party is guided by a Mohawk warrior named Magua, who betrays them all and leads them into an ambush. 
all the British soldiers are wiped out, but Nathaniel and his Mohican father and brother show up in time to save Hayward and the two Monroe sisters. Magua escapes, and Nathaniel tells them that he wasn't a Mohawk, but a Huron. The Huron were allied with the French at the time, and Magua will serve as our antagonist for the remainder of the film due to his personal vendetta against Colonel Monroe and wanting to kill his daughters out of spite and revenge. Our trio of Mohicans say they'll escort Hayward and the women to Fort William Henry. Hayward isn't a horrible person, but he's proud and arrogant and pretty unlikable. Before they left, he proposed to Cora Monroe, who told him she didn't have any feelings for him beyond friendship, but told him she'd think about it. Now, as they are marching through the wilderness, he's confused and upset that Nathaniel isn't a dutiful scout or soldier and has the audacity to just do his own thing. He chastises him, saying, we're at war. How can you be traveling west? And Nathaniel says sarcastically, well, we face to the north and real subtle-like turn left. They come across the Cameron home from the beginning of the film and the family has been killed and the home burned. Nathaniel and his father and brother are quite upset, but they say they have to continue on. Cora is mad that they didn't make time to bury the people and calls Nathaniel heartless, not realizing they were his friends. He later tells her that burying them would be a sign that they'd pass by and help their enemies track them. She apologizes and realizes she knows nothing about life on the frontier. It's not something that's ever occurred to her. She asks Nathaniel, why would people live outside the protection of a city? And he tells her the frontier land is the only land available to poor people wanting to make something for their lives. They arrive at Fort William Henry to find it under siege by the French and Indian forces. This siege is the main historical event of the film. It happened in August of 1757. The fort was situated on the south end of Lake George, about 60 miles north of where Albany is today. The British are taking a beating under heavy bombardment by the French cannons. Our party of six manages to sneak into the fort undetected. Colonel Monroe is upset that his daughters have come for fear of their safety now. He had sent word for them to stay away and requested reinforcements, but he now realizes that the letter must have been intercepted by the French and never received. Nathaniel informs the people at the fort of the attack on the Cameron house and suggests that the colonists fighting at the fort be allowed to leave to defend their homes, which was actually part of the agreement when they signed on to fight in the first place. But Monroe says, too bad. Any man leaving the fort will be shot as a deserter. Nathaniel, though, helps them sneak out anyway and is charged with sedition. He and Cora have fallen for each other by this point, and she pleads with her father for leniency on his behalf. Sedition comes with a death sentence. She also gives Hayward a final no in response to his marriage proposal. Despite her earlier hesitation, he was still just taking it for granted that they would end up getting married. The French have been slowly advancing their trenches and now have their cannons in range of the walls of the fort. With the fall of the fort inevitable, the French commander offers a generous surrender deal. The two parties parlay outside the walls of the fort, and France says the Brits may retreat with their weapons, provided they promise to return to England. It's too good a deal to pass up, so Monroe swallows his pride and accepts. They march out, Nathaniel among them in chains. Now, the Huron and Magua have been fighting alongside the French here, and Magua is furious that the British, specifically Monroe, have been allowed to leave. The French commander, who I should say they did correctly name as the Marquis Louis-Joseph de Montcalm, tells Magua that the French can't violate the terms of surrender, but if he and the Huron were to attack them, that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. So they do. The Huron ambush the retreating British force, attacking them from both sides of the woods uh, along their path. This betrayal of the surrender terms is historical as well. Historians debate whether or not the French encouraged the ambush, but regardless, it did happen. Nearly 200 English were likely killed in the assault, and in real life, they were even more handicapped than in the movie. In the movie, they were able to fire back on the Huron, but in reality, while they were allowed to keep their weapons, they were deprived of their ammunition. The incident served to harden the British in their future encounters against Native Americans. In the film, Nathaniel escapes from his shackles during the battle and saves Cora from certain death. The same group of six that traveled to the fort together escape the ambush together. 
Korra's dad, Colonel Monroe, is killed by Mogwa, who cuts out his heart and promises to kill his children. We've learned by this point that Mogwa blamed Monroe for the loss of his own wife and children. The historical Monroe survived the ambush during their retreat, but did die three months later in Albany. Our party hides behind a waterfall, hoping Mogwa and the Huron will pass them by, but when they realize they are trapped and their gunpowder is wet and useless, Nathaniel and his father and brother decide the best course of action is for Hayward and the women to get captured while they escape and follow them. This is where Daniel Day-Lewis shouts his famous line over the roar of the waterfall, telling Cora to just stay alive and that he will find her. His trio then jumps from the waterfall just before Mogwa's men capture the other three. I don't really get how they knew this was the way to play it. I mean, Mogwa wants the women dead, but of course it works within the context of the movie here. Mogwa takes the women and Hayward back to their village. He does want them dead, but plans to burn all three alive and let the village share the victory. Nathaniel tracks them and then surrenders himself to the will of the Huron leader, hoping to convince him that Mogwa is acting out of self-interest and revenge. The language barrier gets tricky here. Nathaniel speaks English and Mohican. The Hurons speak Huron and French. Hayward does speak English and French, though. So Hayward serves as the translator between Nathaniel and the Huron chief. The compromise the chief decides on is Hayward will be returned back to the British, Cora's younger sister will marry Magua, and only Cora will be burned alive. Obviously not the result Nathaniel was hoping for, so he offers himself as a trade for Cora. Let her go and burn me instead, he says, and tells Hayward to translate. But Hayward, who again, while a jerk, was never a villain, offers himself as the trade, and Cora and Nathaniel are allowed to leave together as Hayward is put to the stake. Cora and Nathaniel leave and join his father and brother outside the village. Nathaniel shoots Hayward from a distance to put him out of his misery from the fire. The four of them then track Magua and Cora's sister, who have left the village as well. Magua wasn't happy with the chief's decision. Nathaniel's brother catches up to and fights Magua, but loses and is killed. Cora's sister then jumps off a cliff and kills herself rather than live as Magua's wife. Nathaniel's father kills Magua, avenging his son, and the movie is basically over here, with Nathaniel's father reflecting that with his natural son now dead, he is the last of the Mohicans. And again, that part is all fictional, but does serve well to give us a look into the, this part of the world at this time. The Seven Years' War, again of which the French and Indian War is only a part, ended in 1763 with the Treaty of Paris. There have been several so-named treaties. Great Britain came out the victor. France conceded Canada and all land east of the Mississippi River. The land west of that will later, of course, be purchased by the United States. Britain also gained Florida from Spain as part of the same treaty. The English did make concessions themselves, giving Havana back to Spain and agreeing to accept Catholicism in its territories. But the net result of the war was British supremacy in Europe. Again, of the Seven Years' War, not just this part of the conflict. The Last of the Mohicans has a 95% on Rotten Tomatoes and won the Academy Award for Best Sound, though it's its score that stands out most iconic today, in my opinion. Elsewhere in the world around this time, two years before the story in our film, Lisbon, Portugal was devastated by an earthquake that killed tens of thousands of people. The reign of Catherine the Great in Russia will begin in 1762. And before the Seven Years' War ended, Britain's King George II died at the age of 77. Up to that time, he was the oldest monarch in English history. Four others have since passed him. He was succeeded by his grandson, George III. Later in his life, George III unfortunately suffered from mental illness, and it's his life we'll look at next week with 1994's The Madness of King George. <laughs> 